and well-being. We are a cross-based center whose mission is to establish an inclusive community that provides leadership and guidance towards the promotion of optimal health and well-being of immigrant children. The work of our center sits on three pillars, clinical services, education, and advocacy. Among various initiatives, we coordinate and lead a pediatric asylum clinic, providing medical and psychological forensic exams to support children and youth um, who are petitioning for asylum. In addition, we're also training the next generation of providers with an immigrant-focused health curriculum. The center is invested in the mental health and wellness of immigrant children, youth, and families, and we are grateful to be partnering once again with First Five Alameda County to offer these events. It is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, Carlos Guerrero and Lourdes Juarez. Carlos Guerrero works as a clinical social worker with early intervention services at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospitals, Oakland. Carlos is an MD from the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana in Bogota, Colombia, and a master's in clinical social work from the California State University East Bay. He provides direct home visiting therapy services for children ages zero to six, as well as supervision, consultation, and training to early childhood infant and family mental health providers, the Resiliency Clinic of, Ch of Children's Hospitals Outpatient Services. Lourdes Juarez is a certified pediatric nurse practitioner whose career has been dedicated to working with the most vulnerable communities. She works at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland Primary Care Clinic, Oakland's Resiliency Clinic, and is a UCSF Assistant Clinical Professor for the School of Nursing. As part of the Center of Excellence um, for Immigrant Child Health and Wellbeing, she coordinates our pediatric asylum clinic. She received her Master of Nursing degree from UCSF and Bachelor of Nursing from UCLA. Um, help me welcome both of them. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Lourdes. Please, uh, please go, go, go ahead. As we introduce, I would like to hear more from you. Let me, I... We will be introducing ourselves uh, briefly, but uh, like, like we'll begin, we're really glad to, to be here. And I really appreciate, especially to see that many familiar faces of different individuals that we have had different spaces where we interact in the community, working with the Alameda County, with the Oakland community, and within that, uh, the different stages of the immigrant families that we interact with. So thank you, thank you for being here. We're going to be talking today about supporting child and family resiliency in immigrant households, and specifically about an intervention that we are facilitating at Children's Hospital, and now is in another um, medical me medical home providers in Alameda County, which is called the Resilience Clinic, and how this relate to 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 the work that we do uh, with immigrant families. To start, um, I just want to add to my presentation that I go with the uh, with the pronouns or he, el or him, and I has been the the pleasure of being and the privilege, I say, of being working uh, here in in Auckland for the for the last twenty five years. So that has provided me, me with some experience of life in this process. And more than that, as I was mentioning, I have had the, the opportunity to work with many of you. And this is an effort to try to integrate the services with, with, with this process. Personally, and I'm an immigrant as well. I migrated here at the age of 27. And, um, and as I migrated here, I know that I migrated with a with a privilege with me, which is that I, I brought my, my degree and, and I migrated in a situation that allowed me to start working really, really quick because my wife uh, is a citizen of the US. So when I met her and migrated with her from Colombia, things were easier for me. Lourdes? Um, hi, welcome. Good morning. Buenos dias. So excited to be here with all of you. Um, I've been in Twitter for quite a few years and um, I have the privilege of working with many of you in, 
in a children's hospital and also uh, in, out in the community. Um, I'm first generation um, Mexican born here and um, been going back and forth to Mexico since I was a kid and I still doing it. I'm looking forward to taking my little one for the first time to visit some uh, family in Mexico. So um, yes, excited to be with all of you. To start really quick, we know that we are a really big group, but I will appreciate if you guys could use the chat and a brief introduction to yourself. Uh, use where, where you're coming from, what organization you are with. And I would like to hear from you guys that you are coming to this training. What is one of the objectives that you have? What you guys would like to, to gain from being with us this hour and a half? So please, if you guys could use the chat and give us some of that information. If anybody prefer to open your microphone, feel free, but we prefer more on the chat because we don't have that much time, but go ahead. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome. Sarah Drew, manager of the regional center of the East Bay. Thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, a lot of intersection with intersectionality with services at the regional center. And thank you for bringing all the way from Sacramento, Lisa. It is really important to hear that. Also, Maria Almanza is here from Special Start Program. Great, thank you. Jorge, it's good to see you. And everybody from that is here from ARS, thank you for being here. Antoinette and Jessica, yeah, good to see you guys. So, Vilma from San Francisco. Jorge. A better way. So uh, as we could see it, and, and I, I will encourage you guys, one, to be able to see the, the screen for those who are able to open the camera, but, but, but to review the names and where we're coming from, because that will give us a real sense of the resources that are available for each one of us. As we work with families, we need to know the community and the different resources within the community. Each one of us alone are not going to be able to provide for all the services that are needed. And yet, networks like this could help us, could help us to collaborate with the others to find services that are more appropriate for families. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. We're going to start with a quick uh, grounding exercise. And we're going to use this because during our intervention, every time that we start with the families, we have different types, not this one, but different types of, of try to have moments where families could be grounded and, and noticing what is happening with them. So I would like to, we would like to start this presentation by please listening to this video. Many of you should be familiar with that. And let's use this time to ground ourselves and to be ready for what we're going to be talking for the next hour and a half. Here it is. I get really mad when my brother hits me a lot. I don't like it when you say you don't want to play with me. When I'm mad, my brain can get a headache and it can start hurting. Your blood keeps pumping because you're like really mad. And you start to get sweaty because you're getting really, really mad. And then when you start getting really mad, you turn red. When your body can't really control yourself, mad just takes over your body. I just get out of control. <coughs> it's kind of like if you had a jar and then the jar would be your brain, and then you put glitter in the jar, and that would be how you would feel. Like. If you shook up the jar and the glitter went everywhere, that would be how your mind looks. And it's like spinning around, and then you don't have any time to think. And you sometimes punch stuff and people when you don't really mean it. When I get angry, I feel it in my heart. I really don't like when I get angry. The amygdala really reacts, but the prefrontal cortex tries to keep it down. 
when I like feel like I want to, you know, get really angry and yell, I just like sometimes, you know, like take a deep breath. Like first you find a place where you can be alone, then you find some way to relax and calm down. When I need to calm down, I take deep breaths. I breathe in through my nose. Sometimes I close my eyes or just take deep breaths. It's like it's calming down, it's like not like moving. It's like slowing down and then it stops. And the heart plumps slow and then it goes into your brain. like all the sparkles are at the bottom of your brain. My brain like slows down and then like I feel more calm and then I'm like ready to speak to that, that person. We're going to start. I just want us to put attention to the intentionality of us showing this video. There are different ways that each one of us will ground ourselves. And this idea of mindfulness is not something new. This idea of mindfulness in, with different names, with different practice, is something to live in all the communities. Everybody. And all the communities have learned in which that they could slow down to calm themselves enough so they could affront what needs to be affront. As we are thinking of war with, with immigrant families, we need to think about what is appropriate for immigrant families based from where they are coming from to provide a spaces where things could slow down which is not necessarily, okay, let's just start having exercises or meditation. It could be. Nevertheless, it's finding a spaces to slow down. Not to rush, to slow down, to help grounding. And to help families as they engage in any interaction with us. To have a space of thinking about their own selves. With that said, I, I would like us to, to make use of that as, as we purposely slow down this process we are starting, what we're gonna be talking about today is about core principles of promoting resilience. As we are thinking about how we could strengthen resiliency in any family, in any child, and specifically in this case, on Im immigrant families. So then we're going to be talking a little bit about the core principles for promoting resiliency. And within, within that specifically, how to mitigate what is described as toxic stress. And for us to understand that the process of migration and the exposure to systems of oppression provide a lot of toxic, toxic stress within the interactions that families are facing, and how that is specifically impacts young children. We are going to try to learn to about the strategies, how we could do to promote not only the child, but the family resilience, because those two things go together. How to provide some information, some anticipatory guidance, some psychoeducation, and at the same time, how to think about how we could be with 
the families as we interact with them as part of the different services that they are going to be providing. And the last part of our presentation is going to focus on describing more, exploring more. What is this intervention that we call the resiliency clinic? An intervention that has been designed to manage stress, promote resiliency in a strengthened relationship between young children and their caregivers. And how we have been using this with newcomers, families, specifically from Latin America. And yet, it is uh, an intervention that is provided with other populations as well. So we're going to jump really quick into the material. Core principles for promoting resiliency in children. So as we're going to enter there, I want to review really quick the adverse childhood experiences study. And what is this study that many people are talking about? This study talks about how, with an early age, a child is exposed to adverse experiences, to stressful experiences. Early age, in those first three, five years of life that is going to impact their developmental process. They are going to need to learn some new skills and avoid others because of that stress, because of what will be happening within their bodies, within the bodies of their family members, those taking care of them. That is going to impact social, emotional, and cognitive process. So the body is being impacted the socialization of the child is going to be impacted. And then when that child continue to grow, if there is no interventions around, the start of life that, it, that this specific in, individual is going to take is going to include higher risk behaviors. Not only what they do, but how they do it and what they eat, how they manage, how they interact with life. So what this study show is that years later, 30, 40 years later, these individuals has statistically more impact of disease, disability, and social problems. And more than that, individuals who have a high number of adverse childhood experiences, they will die earlier in life because they will suffer more of certain illnesses, physical illnesses, and certain problems in terms of their socio-emotional way of managing things. That's what that study show us. And that is why now we, we, we're putting a lot of attention to say, okay, if those exist, what could be done? What could be done early on? And specifically now thinking about immigrant families, how we could think about immigrant families about those kids or those pregnant parents. Not only the mother, but that father who's migrating and who has a family. What is happening with him so he will be able to be present in the best possible way for their kids. So thinking about that, we want us to put attention to the other factor that impact greatly the presence of those adverse uh, adverse childhood experiences, the social conditions, the local context, where the family lives. Many of us have here studies about the zip code and how the zip codes link to certain illnesses because it's about the conditions in that place. And so, so then when immigrant families come, where they are going to be concentrated and where the, where are the impacts in those specific areas? Where are the deficiencies in services in those specific areas? All that brings stress. And the stress, not all the stress is negative. There is some stress that are positive. It's good to have some, some need to move along. Early this morning, I am in bed, it's okay. I have a presentation, some little stress kick in and that gives me the push to keep moving, to get ready, and that's okay. That's what is called positive stress. It's normal thing that our body would do. 
is healthy. And that is in response to a situation that could be tense an event and yet it's manageable. We know how to do it. We move forward and things are not major things. Then in the other extreme, we have toxic stress. Situations of prolonged activities where the activation of the body stress, all the hormones inside of the body get triggered in a chronic way, multiple times, day by day, week by week, month by month. The response, those situations are intense, intense events. And let's think about how much of those events are impacted families when they decide to migrate when they migrate and when they have migrated and they try to rebuild their identity and their their beings where they are and how that stress could be impacted that father that mother that family and through that 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 little child that is already present and or there is coming so when we're talking about toxic stress we're talking about witnessing domestic violence violence in, in the home, violence in the community, activities of neglect, oppression, perpetuated oppression. Now, in the middle of those two, we have what is called tolerable stress. And resiliency gets built in a strengthening the ability of parents, kids, to make the stress tolerable skills that they could develop to make that tolerable, manageable. So then there are moments when there is going to be activation of the body stress response or something that is happening, the act of migration, the dif different struggles. And yet there is a relationship. There is a person present there. We support it of the experience of the child, who help the child to buffer the impact of the stress, not to denounce the stress, not to act that is not happening, but to buffer, to manage with the child that stress. That is what makes stress tolerable. Thinking about the development of the child and this cycle of the stress, this situation of the stress, it's important to locate the critical moments on those first years of life. Oh, during those first months, from birth to those first years, zero to three, zero to five, there is all these specific moments when the impact could be greater on the trajectory of the development child. The sensory pathways, really early on, in that first year of life, those things are being falling in place. And if there is a stress on those ones, those are going to be impacted negatively. The language develop, even if the child do not speak, do not talk, in those first, in that first year of life, there is where those initial exchanges, communications, back and forth, circles of communication with the parents start happening. And those are the basis for language or affect regulation, even for, for higher cognitive function. When a stress is taking place on those moments, the impact is going to be greater and more difficult too. That's why on this process of what is happening through generations and into generation to work in with and or the families that are migrating. We need to think about how this organization, how stress could be passed, could be moved from generation to generation. In a way we could think about what happened between one generation to the next one. What happened to that ability of being present? So when exists, an injury, a situation, the rupture, the ability of continuing that support from one generation to the next. 
displacement, terror, cultural oppression, immigration, many times force a rupture in that process, a not ability of the previous generation to be present and supportive of the next one. So then when that, when that takes place, the new generation coming after that, here we're talking about the third generation, those kids coming are going to face a parent, those hands who make the idea of a parent, who already is bringing these difficulties within their ability of being with them. So then that little baby is going to be impacted as well for those dynamics that displacement, terror, cultural oppression. And from generation to generation, that gets transmitted. It's a way the kids start holding that process within them. The same dynamic we could think about immigration and about the acts of deportation. And to live in a sense that I am in any moment something is gonna happen to me or something is gonna happen to the to those who care for me. Because that constant fear and risk of that happening is going to bring that sense of displacement, systemic terror, cultural oppression. And that is going to be transmitted to the child, to the next generation. That is stress is going to generate this idea of, OK, it's a scary. It's difficult. It's a scary place. What we know is that when that stress impact kids on early age, later on, they are gonna have more illnesses, physically and social emotional struggles. Kids who have more four aces, that's an score that they will give it about how many active, how many, how much impact of those adverse uh, situations happen on those first years of life, which will be the migration, will be the separation from parents, all those are part of those impacts. So if a kid has that, they will have more chances to develop physical illness, asthma, blood pressure, high blood pressure, as well as social emotional struggles, learning or behavioral problems attention deficit behaviors, and hyperactivity behaviors, depression, anxiety. In social norms, teen pregnancy is higher when those ACEs are high at early age. All this that we're describing, the background over what we, we want to provide something that could be useful in the moment to start pro supporting families and children. We need to note that with all this background that I have described, it, there are spaces where and areas where we could start supporting the resiliency of families. And the emphasis is how to intervene early on. Because in the same way that if the stress happened early on, it will disrupt the developmental process. If the support happened early on, if we could make that stress more manageable, that will help to shape brain architecture. That will help to shape gene expressions. And that will help to shape how my body is going to respond to stress. So the areas of intervention need to be early on. The areas of intervention need to be in the importance of having frequent access. So it's not only one intervention, it's having multiple areas where they could, they could receive that support. And the opportunity to partner with caregivers. Interventions are not alone. What I could do or what I could provide is how we could work together with, with the caregivers and with other service providers, with other services around. That's what I was saying when we look into those participating today. We could make sense of 
how many resources we have and how many resources we need to we need to know to be able to be supported for the families. Because to improve the, the outcome for children and families, we need to do many things at the same time. In one end, we need to work to reduce sources of stress. In the other end, we need to support responsible relationships. And we need to work with the parent and the child to strengthen core life skills. I will talk a little bit more about what is that core, core life skills. In a way, we're talking about a little bit, uh, but initially when we were mentioning the Center of Excellence for Immigrant Child and Health Wellbeing and how they think about clinic, clinical services, education and advocacy. All those things need to be done. All those things are part or how we could and provide a better chances for the family of managing the stress. Relate, relational health, to focus on the relational health, to focus on how those parents could be, or those caregivers could be a sense of security and safety for the children is key because Secure relationships equals to resiliency. A strong attachment, strong enrichment for the family, family support services. So what I was mentioning is that this intervention need to be interventions in multiple generations. It's not only what we could do for the child, it is what we could do for the child and the parent and their relationship and working with both at the same time. We need to impact both generations in the moment to ensure that things are gonna be different. When I was talking to, uh, about the, the core life skills, is this ability of being able to be present and reflective as we face struggles. So we need to build those capacities of others to promote resiliency and positive development in children, not only to tell them, but to offer experiences where they could have that experience them, themselves so they could provide it to their kids. So it's not only about providing services, but to build relationships, to build the skills and capacity that enhance their ability, their what, what is called the executive function, that enhance the ability of the others to plan, to focus, to maintain self-control, to be aware, and to bring flexibility to the way of interacting with others. That's what we could do with interventions. In the other end, thinking about advocacy, intervention alone is not gonna be the solution. When there, when there is poverty and oppression, something needs to happen with happen with the poverty and with the oppression. Some specific things need to take, need, need to be done to address the dynamics of, pro, of poverty, to address the dynamics of oppression. The intervention will help, and yet the advocacy is key, not, long, not only for what the families could do, but, but for what levels we're gonna be working to facilitate, to ameliorate, dynamics and the impact of poverty and oppression in the families. In a way, what we're talking is about how to promote safety and how to promote safety, we need to start with building trustiness and transparency into relationships, to build relationships of peer support, to support those things is not only what I could do, but what community could do, the collaboration, and reciprocity in that collaboration is not from top to bottom, but it's how we could cooperate one with the other, looking to empower, to empower the individuals, as well as to hear their voices and to respect their choices on that process. All this within the context of cultural and historical sensitivity, about where they are coming from and what they are facing. So the question is how we do it about it. What could help? 
how to bring hope to families, how to bring an empathic relationship with families, how to find language and loyalty to, to build trust in the relationship, and how to build a partnership with mutual agreement of what we're doing and with a plan to see what, what is gonna be obtained in that process. Lourdes? Great. Thank you, Carlos. And remember that you don't have to be a therapist to practice these things to help facilitate emotions and healing with our families. We could all do this with our, our clients, our patients, our familias. So <clears throat> remembering that, you know, the idea that adversity is not destiny. Even a child that has a high A score can still have a healthy and productive life. Families need a respectful, genuine partnership and communication. Resiliency is described as a ordinary magic because people do this every day and we see this with our families, right? Many of us have heard this, right? But one of the main um, frame shifting principles of trauma-informed care is to stop asking what's wrong with you, but asking what happened to you. This puts us in a more empathetic and curious mindset that helps us to practice empathy by listening to and acknowledging what is being said. Just the act of listening is therapeutic. We listen, we create a space for people to share the story, we allow people to speak about diff difficult experiences, and when something becomes speakable, it becomes tolerable. I recall an immigrant family with a three-year-old who was from El Salvador. It took mom three years to finally realize she needed help. I was there along the way to provide that safe and trusting environment so she could someday share that story. And she realized that her marital problems were affecting her child's well-being. And that was the start. And we talked and I we listened. As Dr. Gillespie, an early pioneer in pediatric trauma informed care once said and shared, the key message is, you aren't alone, it's not your fault, I'm here to help. This brings us to another frame-shifting principle of trauma-informed care. And let's just move from asking, how can I fix you, to how can I understand you better? And moving from a mindset of fixing to one of understanding helps us to listen more empathetically. We use this by using the same language as your family. Express loyalty and showing it by saying, I'll be here for you. Practice parallel processing by treating parents in the same way you want parents to treat their children. For instance, model that behavior. Celebrate the small success. Notice and acknowledge something that the parent is doing well. Or ask, what do you like about your child? You'll be amazed what they would tell you about your child by that one simple question. And when talking to immigrant families, ask about their experience. Provide that space to talk about their loss, about their stress, about their journey and how they got there. And remember to ask permission before addressing the issue of problem solving. May I ask you more about what happened? Let the family know that we're here to work on this together and help families set goals. Our Im immigrant families come to us with medical, behavior, and developmental concerns. They look at us for guidance and planning, but most importantly, like any other family, a place that they feel safe and trust to address their concern and share their story. This is a great parent handout from Pace Connect. It gives us great reminders of many things that parents are already doing, and we could continue to do intentionally to promote resiliency in their kids. For example, you know, encourage you move and play more, make eye contact, give those 20 second hugs and allowing a slowing down time to reset and be present for your child. A few uh, quotes that we use, next slide, is from Dan Siegels. For example, some of these are, you know, connect and then reconnect, be curious, not furious and provide the undivided attention and attunement, right? Or name entertainment and catch them being good. Other tips that we are helpful to promote resiliency is to provide that dedicated time in, the special time in without 
any interruptions for at least 10 or 15 minutes a day. The child picks activity and leads activity. It has proven to promote resiliency and it's money in the bank. It helps reestablish motivation for positive behavior. I remember a family, you know, struggling in the morning, um, trying to get the kids to, to daycare. And it was always, you know, challenging. And, you know, mom took this to heart. And she said, you know what, I'm going to wake up 10 minutes before and give that special time to my two kids before. And she came back and reported to us. She said, it was like magic. Everything was different. Everybody was calm, right? Took that 10 minutes to play with him, cuddle with him, hug him in the morning. And it just made a world of big difference. And, you know, I use this a lot with my family when they're struggling with their kids, especially in the morning trying to take them to daycare. Next slide. So now let's talk a little bit more about resiliency clinics. So I'll be describing a multidisciplinary program at Children's Hospital called Resiliency Clinics. So great. So this is a quote from um, one of our parents who participated in resiliency clinic said during a focus group as we were converting from in-person to Zoom, as she said, it's life-changing, just bring it back. So we did. So what exactly is Resiliency Clinic? Well, a clinic is an interactive group-based intervention for parents of young children zero to five with a history of significant adversity. Most children are referred by their primary care uh, providers following a positive ACE screen or a verbal, verbal disclosure of a potential traumatic event. Groups are designed to teach mindfulness and other resiliency promoting skills and promote stronger parent and child relations. Groups are being held by Zoom and personally we're doing a newcomer uh, immigrant evening session in Spanish at this time. So our program and resiliency clinic touch on three facets. Uh, with the help of a multidisciplinary team that includes a social worker or therapist trained in early child mental health, an early intervention specialist, a pediatric medical provider, and a health educator slash perhaps navigator. We provide supporting uh, responsive relationships through psychoeducation based on evidence-based parenting education like the circle of security, security parenting. We use a strength uh, strengthening core life skills, particularly those principles of mindfulness to help manage stress and promote self-regulation skills for both adults and children. We also um, provide a screen for basic needs and development behavior in caregiver depression, right? We do this with um, the help of our Find Connect desk at Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland, and they do this by supporting our families and giving them vital information services in our community. Now, in thinking about the resilience clinic and the immigrant families, um, what we tried on um, the process of the resilience clinic is how to attune to the need of the family and as uh, Lourdes was describing, we provide this clinic for recent immigrants, for newcomers. And at this moment, it is happening Thursday at, uh, at 6 p.m. And what we try on those is to specifically give a space for the families. One, to, to hear what is happening to them and to be able to think with them together, how their experience is impacting their family. In resilience clinic, we have three factors that we're trying to support for the families. One end is to provide some parent education support. And for that, we use uh, some concepts of circle of security, but we do not provide parents with circle of security training. What we provide is that we use some information from circle of security to open a conversation with the parents to see how those things are working with them at this moment and how the process of stress immigration has been impacted or has made this different in terms of how to be in relationship with their kids. So we provide in one end, this pioneering education support using a lot of information from 
an attachment based intervention that is called circle of security. So we introduce parents to, to that. We do not bring parents to to take the whole circle of security framework. On the other end, we try to bring parents where so how they could be grounded. So what we know is the, mind, uh, the mindfulness helps to develop resiliency. So we try to bring to the parents experiences where they could bring attention to the present moment. When they could be heard without judgment and they could start thinking about their experience and the experience of others without judgment. And bring focus to the present, what is happening now. So that's what I said. It is not necessarily to develop spaces of meditation, but spaces where people could slow down. In that way, when that is in place, they will have the space to reflect about it, to have that higher order cognitive process. And they could start reflecting and learning about, okay, what is what they could be doing in the moment? The other part of what we include uh, on this intervention, in addition to the psychoeducation around the relationship, is this other information of psychoeducation around how to stress, how we respond to stress and what could we do to manage stress. And for that, we'd use uh, an intervention that is called dovetail process again similar to with circle of security we do not bring them to a training of dovetail what we use the, is the information of dovetails so they could find and understand ways to manage the stress Your yeah. so how did our um resiliency clinic get started well it started back in 2018 at um at our federal qualified health center primary care clinic 90% are our families identify as Black or Latinx with um, more than 90% at or below federal par poverty level. <clears throat> we initially started with an in-person group for 0 to 17. This lasted for two years, and then we converted um, to Zoom during the pandemic. In 2020, we focused on 0 to 5 due to funding, and we did a co-design focus group with parents to help us plan our Zoom groups. So, so far we have like 64 uh, diets, but I now uh, most recently we have between 80 to uh, 90 diets uh, complete the program. So um, the groups consist of six weekly visits via Zoom, uh, includes child parent activity, a parent circle, a brief one-to-one -one medical visit, either at the beginning or at the end. Ages are from zero to five, and we have a mental health and medical provider, a developmental specialist, and a community health navigator. And we um, bill our, our visits as groups, right? So if they have Medi-Cal or they're part of medical manage, you know, most of our, our families uh, from our federal qualified health centers have Medi-Cal. So we incorporate and we have a billing system to bill for groups. A key part of this is the staffing, which is multidisciplinary. It's not in one person. It's on, it's on the entire team. How to provide and how to be with the families in that process. Mm -hmm. And um, we provide care packages, right? And these care packages include emotion books, bubbles, sensory balls, uh, workbook session, and they're delivered to families' homes a week before their initial sessions. This helps us to reconnect with families uh, in person. Uh, families are very appreciative, appreciative of getting their packages. Um, this helps to further assist our dyads and learn a site that otherwise we wouldn't have an opportunity to know during our Zoom or perhaps our in-person visits. And also it helps with um, attendance. Families have said that they use these packages in many ways. Um, for example, um, their child have taken their emotion books to to school. Uh, parents use their squeezy balls for during a very stressful day, and they like to share the video links with their family members. So these are only a few examples that are our families using their using these tools. And, and all these materials based on the group, they will be in, in the language that is appropriate to the to the group. 
will be Spanish. Here we have a picture of materials in English. At the Asian Health Center, they are doing groups in, in Mandarin. So the idea is to be, to provide intervention in the language that is more appropriate to the family, as well as the, 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 the packages for them. Because the idea of these packages is not just to give it to them, but during the groups to talk in terms in which way those could be used in the relationship with the kids. The toys, the books, the resources. Um, in every um, activity we do, a mindful grounding activity at the beginning of our session, just like we did at, with you today at our beginning of our presentation, um, many parents have described how we use these tools that they learn to manage stress. So this is really great. Um, one thing I just want to add, um, parents have said to us that this is a quote from a parent. My behavior was too rough with my kids and not too much, but I learned how to breathe and settle down during that moment when I don't think. And another parent has mentioned that um, that even their child has reminded, reminded them and said to them, remember to breathe, mo mommy, right? So simple to do, yet we all need to be reminded from time to time. So managing um, big feeling is another part of our cycle education that we do with our family. Um, in this session, we go over the hand brain model by Dan Siegel. We have caregivers use their, their, their hand and have an example of their brain, right? Um, you know, we use the what happens when you flip your lid and the upstairs and downstairs brains are not communicating. Um, your thumb is your big emotion and it's out of control. And we make good decisions by gently hugging your, your, your feelings and gently hugging your feelings with your upstairs brain to have just, you know, be more calmer, right? So as mentioned before, we provide families with books in our care packages. And one of the books is The Angry um, Octopus. This book goes over breathing and relaxation um, tips and exercise for our families. And again, the, this information is not only information, you know, the, the brain hand model, for example, description. That is the information. And then we practice that and reflect with them how this look for you, how how to think about that, what that happened to, with us, how that will happen with kids, and what is needed in that process. So in one end is the psychoeducational information, in the other end is the ability to make this relevant to the family that we're talking with, to that family that had just migrated and that is facing a lot of struggles. And not just to put this on the out of, this is how your brain works, it's not, it's how mm -hmm. those pressures that are happening in the moment, missing their family in, in their country of origin, facing eviction, facing uncertainty, how that is triggering their ability of engage that cortex to manage feelings. And having the opportunity to reflect, to think together with somebody else about that brings greater ability to that parents to manage the, that in a better way with their kids. So we, with the videos, with the exercises, with the information, with the books. The idea is not just to bring those, those but to use those as a, as a point of interaction and reflection with them. And all of this, like I mentioned before, we have that in, in Spanish as well as English and other languages. Big part of that um, is the process of, of how to reflect with parents. And, and how to think with parents about any concept in terms of relationship, how this works for them, how that looks for them. I'm going to encourage you guys. I'm going to show you a video. Today. It's possible many of you guys have seen it, but when you are seeing this, I would like you guys to think well, what could be the experience of a, a family under stress, an immigrant family? Many families that you have been working with. But you watch this this video to talk about connection. Let's, let's think about how this could be for a family that has been facing the struggles of being a newcomer. 
we're, I'm gonna watch this, I'm gonna show this, and after that, we're gonna go to, for, for five minutes, to a small group, to have a conversation in the small group about your experience watching this video. What I would like you to do is to watch this video with the lens and the knowledge that you have of working with immigrant communities. How this will be for them to talk and to reflect about this video. Here it is. As parents, we've all asked these kinds of questions. How can I stop my child behaving like this? What do I do to manage her behavior? Is there something wrong with him? Why would she behave like this just to get attention? But what if the problem lies in the question? If instead we ask, how can I improve my relationship with my child? And what is her behavior telling me? We start to see that the need for attention is actually a need for connection. A child's behavior is in fact a form of communication and it is driven by this need for an emotional connection. Children need emotional connection with their parent as a secure base to go and explore the world. And they need it to be a safe haven to come back to when things get too difficult. It's possible to control your child's behavior by threats, rules and rewards. But stickers, treats and time out lose their effectiveness eventually. The thing that really changes them is your presence and unconditional love. The bottom line is, they are more likely to behave well when they're feeling secure in their emotional connectedness and safe in our love. Love isn't just a warm, fluffy feeling, and it certainly doesn't mean giving in to them. Far from it. Your children need you to be bigger, stronger, wiser, and kind, so you can both set limits and take the time to understand your child's emotional world and respond to it, helping them make sense of their mess and confusion. We know this isn't straightforward. That's why with Circle of Security Parenting, we try to support parents in this way of relating to their children, from newborns to teenagers and beyond. In fact, we're seeing remarkable effects when this way of thinking is applied to other important relationships as well. Whatever the question, learning to be connected is a big part of the answer. Whatever is the question, to learn how to be connected is a big part of the answer. We're gonna go to small groups of four to five people. Please talk about what caused your attention about this video, thinking about the process of migration and stress. Anything surprise you? What comes to your mind? We will be there for five minutes and then we will come back to go over the last part of our training. Everybody's back. Thank you. I would like to hear from your conversation on this small group. Why, what came live? What, what things called your attention and how, how you think, what could be triggered to watching this video and what type of conversations could be, could be addressed uh, showing this to, to families? Anybody would like to share? Um, when we were talking in our group, um, a few different things came up, not only with us as being parents and remembering that our children also need that, you know, um, comfort blanket or whatever you want to call it, um, but that not only children of immigrant families, but immigrant parents as well, because not only are they trying to figure out how to navigate in a new world, basically, they're trying to protect their children from whatever it was they were running from or whatever the case may be. And um, it's, it, it's, it's sad to say that not everybody can be that understanding to try and be as helpful to those immigrant families. You know, they're more, there's people who are more like, why are they here? They're taking from us Americans, you know, whatever the case may be. And it's just, I wish people could be more empathetic and give more of that emotional support to people who are coming here 
to see, you know, refuge or whatever it is. Thank you, thank you very much, Sarah, and and highlighting and and that's that's one of the keys in the intervention, you know, highlighting all the points that you were describing. One is the empathy again is working in two generations, thinking about the child, thinking about the parent, and how to relate with the parent and what you are describing, which in other words is in, is not judgmental, but also allowing the parent to talk about those difficulties, those struggles, those personal struggles that interrupts their ability to be with in the way that they would like to be with their kids. The key of the intervention is about finding that empathy, to empathize with the experience of the parent, and as we do that, to think about the experience of the child, to see what we could do together not to give solution, but what could be done, what could be built in that. So I really appreciate the empathy that you are describing and your emphasis that it is about work in both generations. Somebody else would like to share something come to your mind? Um, i like to share. All right, um, thank you, Jeff. So throughout the video, there were various examples and scenarios are represented to illustrate how parents can um, effectively apply these components to their um, to their interactions with children. Um, so the aim to me was to help parents develop a deeper understanding of their child's needs and strengthen the bond between them. Thank you. Yes, that is one. Uh, is Thank you for describing. We're looking for that and with the empathy to the parent and to recognize that of course there are all those opportunities. And of course there are moments when we're not gonna be able to do it. Yes, we could connect and sometimes we can. Yes, I wish to happen and sometimes doesn't take place. So then to open the space to think when does it happen? What we could learn, what we could do to do that. What other resources exist in the moment? So thank you. And, and the idea is to tap into that, and to tap on the awareness about the need for that connection. And as we tap into that, thinking about the child, thinking about that, about the parent too, and thinking about within where we are, within our community, what are those resources to be able to, to support the parent and the child and the family on that path? Thank you. What we watch, and a little bit what we have here, is part of the, the conversation that we'll have with the families. And the points that you were describing are the points that the parents will describe. Because yes, this brings memory of any parenting activity. And the importance is how to attune at the situation that the families are facing. If there are recent immigrants, if there are no recent immigrants, but are still dealing with the process of immigration. And as we have other groups where immigration is not the issue and yet systems of oppression and stress continue to be the issue. So what we have is a little size of the, how the group is being held and provided. Um, Lourdes, could you share the PowerPoint? And we have other information, you know. Right there, we talk about the connection, and we in each session we will present a different information or animation to facilitate some of these conversations. Next. And I, I was saying towards the end, we provide two two sessions only dedicated to think about how, how the stress manifests in our body, how we learn to manage stress, what we call the protective patterns using the language of dovetail, which is the ways that we react to stress, not as a something pathological, but something that we have learned through life. 
and we go over those protective patterns and we try to bring this awareness to how sometimes those help us and how sometimes when those becomes a pattern, we start making more problems for our lives. After that, the second session is about, about how to support the development of centering skills. The examples that we're showing to you there is a, another video that we use to think about different strategies of breathing and or centering in our bodies. It, sometimes we show to the parents to, to make use to see in, in which way they could do those things. Next. So some of the uh, lessons learned that we um, as staff reflected on during when we were doing this uh, Zoom visits were the importance of personal uh, connection, right? You know, the dropping off of care packages at families' homes really brought a personal touch and also meeting face-to-face -face when we couldn't meet face-to-face -face, uh, during that time. Um, the possibility of sharing a deep, uh, you know, uh, conversation in Zoom uh, could be um, possible. However, it's more limited because it's harder to to um, bring the amount of group processing that we wanted to, right? The port the importance of cultural concordant messengers to build a connection and trust. Uh, the process of communication, not just the content, but it's not enough just to share the information. How this information gets shared matters greatly, right? Responsive caregiving is something that gets reinforced through experience, through caring relationship, and not just through words. Um, this is um, feedback from care, um, caregiver, a focus group, right? Most of our participants said that they would um, um, highly recommend this because it helped with dealing with children and parents' mental health, right? Um, they felt that one hour was too short. Um, Zoom was convenient and comfortable, and they didn't have to worry about childcare. And they requested to share the video links. Some of the highlights um, that the families remember were the breathing exercise, the be curious, not furious, the shark music, the hand brain model, and the toys and the books that we were um, delivered to the families. Uh, this is a, a quote that speaks to the impact of receiving the clinic on caregiver child relationship. This program has been a lot of help. It helped me personally with my relationship with my older daughter. This program helped me a lot with learning about how to have quality time with my children, how to play with them, and how to manage frustrations. This is part of a quote in a Spanish group. I'm going to skip this one over and go to the caregiver surveys, right? Um, this was done in 14 participants of the CDC clinic. 92% um, said that they would refer this to other families. 100% um, said that they learned something that helped them cope with stress. And 93% said that they have noticed a positive change in their child's behavior. Like we mentioned before, um, this is a, an expansion. Um, we have um, done this group settings in non-clinical areas too. It's a grant called the Practice Grant. Our goal is to strengthen partnerships to respond effectively to adverse childhood experiences. Uh, develop new sustainable evidence-based services, and to expand the workforce to address toxic stress among our medical beneficiaries. Some of the clinics that are part of this um, grant and who are doing uh, residency clinic is La Clinica La Raza, uh, one clinic in Oakland, another one in Pittsburgh, Agent Health Services, Banco Bancroft Peds, Carry Kids, Roots Banana, uh, Woman Day Time Drop-In Center, and the uh, YMCA in Oakland. Used to to describe that they, they, they have been doing this. They already in each of those places have run at least one and some of them two or, or three groups because this was done during the last six months, seven months, and we're looking forward for them to continue this. Um, so this is to answer one of the questions to say how to refer. Mm -hmm. So specifically, is through the medical through the medical provider. Our children's hospital, if the medical provider is, is a pediatrician from children's, it could be referred to our resilience clinic. And yes, all these other clinics of centers, they are running these groups as well mm -hmm. in English, in Spanish, in Mandarin, and other languages. Uh, 
a nutshell, what we're looking with this intervention is how to support the shift in the mindset from, from us as providers, as well as to support that, that empathic treatment for the parents as well. The thing is about relational health. It's all about relationships and connection. All the other services need to be there and the relationship and connection need to be present. How important is this act of listening, actively listening to understand, not to have more questions, but to understand. And based on that, the interventions will develop. It's about a strengthening base support. How to strengthen that is what, what, what is gonna bring the change. Within that importance of hope and connection, to be able to see something that is doable is key in this process. Change of mindset, we can do this now. This is something doable. It's not a mountain that can cannot be claimed. It's a mountain that we, with the support of others, could overcome. Thank you. We would like to, to open you guys some questions or comments uh, that you guys would like to, to share with us. We could stop the PowerPoint and just see our faces. And anybody will have a comment or question. Emily, mm -hmm. Leon. If the sessions are six weeks, um, I think is what I saw. If there was a parent or a parent that has another child that would like to retake the the program, is this something you guys are open to? Yes, of course. No, and and these six sessions and the, the idea is more to adjust to the to the need of the parent. So so yes, it's not something to will exclude. The parents, the, the idea is, like I said, to, to to follow the need of them. Some parents have repeated the intervention. Some parents have started in the middle and then come back to complete that. There is a study that is done parallel to, to this process. So, so the data won't be included in that study because that will alter the evaluation. Nevertheless, again, the idea is to, to attune and to respond to the needs of the parents. Nevertheless, what we look is to link them with other services within the community. But yes, the answer to your question is yes, they can. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Rosa. <laughs> hey. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to share that um you know in um in the video we're talking about the the children's you know attention and the need for in, you know they want to connect and especially well in this case for immigrant families how hard it is to uh, connect not only because there's other barriers and in many cases the parents are um, struggling financially and yeah. but um, you know the the need for attention is uh, they want to spend time with the parents and in in many cases the parents or have two jobs and, or, no time. or they're being raised by, uh, you know, a third person or someone, um, grandparents. So yeah, those are the big challenges of our families, immigrant families. And um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, I'd, I'm, I'm sure at the, uh, the clinic, um, you, you give us, you give, um, more tools and resources, hopefully, to, to work with these families when they don't have of, as much time. Of course, of course, in terms of additional resources. And the other part, 
exactly what, what you are describing, Ross, is really important. Is what we would say, name entertainment. You know? So let, to open a space to talk about that, to talk about the difficulty of not, not seeing that I have the time to, of the pain of saying, yes, I know my child needs that, but I cannot do it. And to open a space to connect with the parent on that struggle. Yes, of course, other resources are going to be tried to be provided, and yet to be able to acknowledge that, not in a judgmental way of, sorry, you need to do it. No, no it's about oh, how hard it is, and let's think together. Let's talk about what are those moments when we could connect, how those, those work. And parallel with that, what we're saying, the advocacy needs to be present, the advocacy to what else is available. So, so thank you. And and Thank again, you. the idea in those moments is to connect to, to that need as well and to name it, not to not just to hear it, but to name and to talk a little bit about that, even if it's tough, not only for the parent, but for the other parents listening to that and for whoever is facilitating. It's not an easy conversation, but it's it's good to have it. Thank you. Thank you. I know we are close to the end. We have two more two minutes left. Uh, I know Leah will be sending an evaluation for you guys to complete. So please take your time to complete that. Uh, as we're saying goodbye, I would appreciate if you guys could leave a message on the, uh, on the chat or what is one word or one short sentence. What is your takeaway? What, what you would take away from this conversation that we have today for an hour and a half? I will appreciate for those of you who could put one word or short sentence. I really appreciate your time and more than your time, the commitment mm -hmm. and the work that all of you are doing. And I look forward to areas of collaboration. And in whatever way we could be supportive of the work that you are doing, please feel free to get in contact with us. And thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, any questions, please send us an email, give us a call. We're happy to to talk.